Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Digest a little bit. Okay. Food is good. Food is wonderful. I love food. Food gives me sustenance. Tastes good. Who here likes disco? Anyone here like to cook? Me? Yeah. What, what, what do you like? What do you like to make? Pancakes. Brownies. Eggs. Right. Eggs. I like making That's me. Cereal. I don't fish in a microwave. I mean, if, but my wife says if it can't be microwave, in my mind it can't be cooked. Um, so, but we do actually have a celebrity, celebrity chef in our midst. Has anyone heard of the show Chopped? Chopped. Okay. So recently, our, our speaker, Sister Alicia, was actually on the show Chopped. They had a special Chopped. session. And she actually won the ten thousand dollar prize. We're going to show you a little, little quick clip of chop. Special chop. We're giving thanks for four soup kitchen chefs. These are chefs who don't seek out the Share her life, her story, um, and especially her passion for Christ and his church. So I want to introduce to you Sister um, Alicia. Thank you so much. I didn't know they were going to show that. <laughs> it's kind of awkward watching yourself on TV. I feel really odd. It's super awkward, but whatever. Um, it's so good to be with you today. Thank you for coming out for this confirmation retreat. Um, are all of you going to be confirmed this year? Everyone here? Okay, awesome. Awesome. All right, so you might be a little familiar with our community, the Franciscans of the Eucharist. We work on the west side of Chicago at Our Lady of the Angels Mission. You saw some footage actually from the mission, which is really cool. So we work with the poor there, and we also go out to help preach the gospel in different ways, especially through retreat work and giving talks and that sort of thing. So it's really great to be with you today. We actually ran by a parish of a friend of ours who's the pastor there in Hillside, we ended up giving a spontaneous talk to their confirmation group on the way here. So it's really fun. It's a confirmation day for us. So we're really glad to be with you. Um, so for this talk, let's just start with a prayer, and then I've got a passage from Scripture, and then we'll see what happens after that, okay? Got it? Okay, so we've got the Christmas so we'll thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the gift of life. We ask you to continue to open our hearts more and more to your message of love and mercy, to your call to be disciples. Help us to follow the example of Jesus, who came to show us how to live and to teach us how to love one another, and continue to open our hearts to your Holy Spirit, that we may do your will in our lives. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so this is a reading from... 
from the Gospel of Luke. I would invite you, if you want to close your eyes, whatever you need to do to really listen to the words of the story, so we know that the scripture is the inspired word of God, right? St. Paul talks about it this way. He says that it's like a two-edged sword that pierces to the heart. So there's power in these words that we hear from scripture. And there's power in the stories of what happened when Jesus was here and how he had relationships with people, right? How many of you enjoy friendships in your life? Anybody here? Yeah. How many of you would say that friendships are probably one of the most important things in your life? A lot of us, right? Can anyone tell me what is the most important friendship that we could ever have? Who is the person we could have the most important friendship with? God. With God, exactly, that's right. But sometimes, is it hard to believe that? Does anybody agree with me sometimes it's hard to have a friendship with God? It's hard, right? Why is it hard? Well, because sometimes it's hard to realize that God can relate with us, can communicate with us in ways that we can understand and receive. So when we enter into these scripture stories, they help us to realize that God wants to be close to us, that he sent Jesus to walk with us, that Jesus was totally human, right? Totally human, but totally divine. Whoa, it blows your mind because it's a mystery. But Jesus came to show us just how close God wants to be with us. And he gave his total whole self, right? He gave his whole self for us when he died on the cross. Then what happened on the third day? He rose again. Are you excited about that? Yeah? How many of you are excited that Jesus rose from the dead? Do you realize that this changes everything about our lives? Jesus really rose from the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, we wouldn't be sitting here today. The Catholic Church would not exist if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Him rising from the dead changes everything for us. So we're going to listen to this story from Luke's Gospel. I guess if you can close your eyes, people would whatever. But just really pay attention to these words of Jesus. This is the call of Simon the fisherman. While the crowd was pressing in on Jesus and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats there alongside the lake. The fishermen had disembarked and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, he asked him to put out a short distance from shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. After he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. Simon said in reply, Master, we have worked hard all night and have caught nothing. But at your command, I will lower the nets. When they had done this, a great, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets were tearing. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come to help them. They came and filled both boats so that they were in danger of sinking. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at the knees of Jesus and said, Depart from me for I am a sinful man. For astonishment at the catch of fish they had made seized them and all those with him, and likewise James and John, the sons of Debedee, who were partners of Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. When they brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Awesome. So this is a pretty epic story. I want to share a little bit with you about this story. I'm going to share a little bit with you about my own journey. And then we'll pull it together about what does that mean for all of us. Okay? So three things. This story, my own story, and then what this means for all of us. As people who want to walk with Jesus, who want to be disciples. Want to help make this world a better place? Anybody in here want to make this world a better place? Anybody here agree that there's a lot of problems in our world right now? Anybody here want to be part of the solution to that? So this is what confirmation is about. It's about in and through our faith becoming part of the solution to all the trouble in our world. And it's true. And all of us can be part of that. So this story of Peter is really amazing. Um, this past summer, I know you guys are going to you're like, are you serious? This really happened. This past summer, 
I went on what's called a 30-day silent retreat. So for 30 days, a whole month, I went away to a retreat house and I was pretty much quiet for 30 days and I went on this special retreat experience that is hundreds of years old that was started by a man named St. Ignatius of Loyola and he started a community of priests and brothers and they're called the Jesuits and part of their tradition is that during their years of preparing to be priests they take time aside to go on this long 30-day retreat to try to build their friendship with Jesus, to try to understand how Jesus works in their own hearts and how they can respond to that. So I went on this 30-day silent retreat. Long time, right? It's a long time to be quiet. Um, one of the things that I discovered on that retreat was something really special about St. Peter. So I used to look at St. Peter and I was like, yeah, St. Peter, he's like the leader of the church, right? And he was the first pope, or he died as a martyr for the faith. But something I never really realized about St. Peter was that St. Peter and I have a lot in common, okay? Because St. Peter, just like many of us, when Jesus first came to him, he was kind of like, Lord, maybe you should pick somebody else. Lord, are you sure you got the right person? St. Ignatius reflects based on the gospel stories. According to St. Ignatius, Peter was approached by Jesus three times where he finally left everything and followed Jesus. So according to Ignatius, as he reads the scriptures, this passage from Luke was the second time. Because Jesus had already seen Peter after John the Baptist pointed Peter out, or pointed out to Andrew, Peter's brother, that Jesus was the one they were waiting for. So John is baptizing, Jesus gets baptized by John, and then Andrew is with John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is like, Andrew, that's Jesus, that's the one you want to follow. Then Andrew goes and gets his brother, Peter, and he's like, Peter, I found him. He's here, you know? And they start following Jesus, and then Peter's like, I gotta go back to my boat. I gotta go back and take care of my stuff, you know? And then, this is the second time, Jesus has got his eye on Peter, because he knows that Peter has gifts and talents that can be powerful for the kingdom. And so Jesus wants Peter to be part of his group, part of his disciples. So Jesus shows up on this lake shore, and he knows Peter is there, and Jesus is preaching to the people, and they're listening to his words, because Jesus' words have a strong power, and people are being nourished in their hearts by what Jesus is saying. And so there's so many people, he wants to get in his boat so he can get a little bit of distance and use that as a platform to get his word to the people, right? Now, anybody in here a fisherman? Anybody here ever gone fishing? Okay, so... If you want to catch fish, what's the best time of day to go fishing? Anybody know? In the morning, right? So if you were Peter, and it's the middle of the day, and the sun is blaring on the lake, and Jesus said to you, hey, let's put the nets out, what would be your first thought? It's the middle of the day. Is this the best time to go fishing? No, it is not the best time. It's the worst time to go fishing. So here's Peter with this guy, Jesus, who's a carpenter, not a fisherman. Does carpenter know anything about fishing? Probably not, right? And so Peter's here with this carpenter, and the carpenter's telling him how to fish. If you were Peter, do you think you would take Jesus seriously? You'd be like, who does this guy think he is, right? Tell me how to go fishing. But no, there was something about Jesus that gave what he had to say some power. And so Peter, despite what seemed to be incredibly impractical to put nits out in the middle of the day when they had already tried all night, like the story said, right, to catch fish, he puts the nets out. And then what happens? What happens after he puts those nets in the water? Do you remember? When they put the nets down, what happened? They caught a lot of fish. So many fish that they had to get their friend's boat, right? And then what does it say? It says, there's so many fish that the boats are in danger of sinking, right? Holy cow, this is crazy. So here's Peter with Jesus, and he's got these boats full of fish, and he's thinking to himself, you know, I know that I've got a lot of issues in my life and in my heart, right? I got some trouble. I am not the best guy out there. And I got this Jesus guy who's clearly something special, right? Trying to come and get me to join him. And so Peter sees what's going on, he knows what's in his heart, and he just gets down on his knees, and he's like, you know what, Jesus, you want to just go away from me, because I am a sinner. And Jesus looks at Peter, and he looks at his friends, 
And he looks at that boat, and he says to Peter, what? What's the first thing he says in response? Does anybody remember that famous line from Scripture that Jesus says so many times? Does anybody remember what Jesus said to Peter? That's right. The first thing Jesus says, he doesn't say, you're going to be fine, Peter. He doesn't say, I don't care, Peter. He says, Peter, be not afraid. He says, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be fishing for men. You're going to be fishing for men. And from that point on, Jesus knew, or rather Peter knew what Jesus meant, right? So Peter drops everything to follow Jesus. And there's one more story with Peter and the boat and Jesus, where he finally leaves the boat. He really likes that boat. It's kind of a thing, right? Okay, but what's the point of the story is that all of us here in this room are probably aware of the things we struggle with, right? Anybody in here know what your struggles are, what your weaknesses are? Anybody here aware of where sin is involved in your life, right? So we're aware of those things. And in spite of all that, Jesus wants to be our friend. He wants us to walk with him, and he wants us to help him reach out to the people in our world. That's the point of the story. It didn't matter the things that Peter struggled with. Jesus wasn't focusing on Peter's weaknesses, but he knew the beautiful things about Peter, the talents Peter had, the gifts Peter had, that could be powerful for the kingdom to help bring a message of love and mercy to the world. When you've made a mistake, you realize it, and you experience forgiveness and healing from that bad choice you made, does it feel better? Feel better? Yeah? Now, if you have done something that you're not proud of, and you realize it was wrong, you experience forgiveness, you experience God's love, do you think your heart will be a little bit softer when you meet somebody who also has that same struggle? Do you think you'll be a little bit more compassionate? Anybody agree with me? Raise your hand if you agree. You'll be a little bit more compassionate if you know what it is to fall, right? To have to struggle through that. Jesus knows we're weak. That he knows that when we experience his love, when we let him into our lives to help us with our struggles, not only does that heal us, but because we know our own weaknesses, we can open our hearts more to other people that are struggling, right? We can reach out to them. We can know, hey, I was where you were at one time. I know what it's like to feel that way, and I want to walk with you. I want to help you make a better choice, right? That's what it's about. It's not about Jesus isn't looking for perfect people. He's looking for people who want to have a friendship with him, want to believe in his power to help change our hearts, right? That's what it's about. So, cool, I love this gospel story. Now, in my own life, I mean, obviously, like, I wasn't born like this. I didn't come out of the womb as a sister, right? <clears throat> what happened to me was, when I was in college, I was taking my faith pretty seriously, but I never thought about being a sister. I wanted to actually be a naval officer. <laughs> that was my goal, so I spent all of high school you know, playing every sport I could, doing all that sort of stuff to get into the Naval Academy. It didn't work out, but I got a ROTC scholarship for Navy, so I went to Loyola University on that scholarship. Ended up not working out for me, so I had to give the scholarship up. I was at Loyola, working really hard, pretty involved in my faith. When I was a junior in college, there was a lot of stuff going on on campus that I wasn't comfortable with. A lot of my peers were not making really good choices for themselves, weren't respecting their bodies, lots of stuff like this. And I looked out at my friends and I'm wondering to myself, like, God, you know, people just don't seem happy here. Why do people make these choices that hurt themselves and hurt each other? You know, and I was just asking this question. And it was at that time when I was trying to understand, how can I love people better? How can I be a better friend? How can I be a better follower of Jesus? I really felt the Lord in my own heart call me or prompt me to be a sister, which like made no sense, because why would I do that, right? And so it was very strange to me, but I figured, you know, there's got to be something about this, and so slowly, over time, step by step, I opened my heart up a little bit more and a little bit more to try to hear this call in my own life. I started to pray a little bit more. Eventually, I was brave enough to start visiting sisters, because you know, once you do that, it's kind of like, oh no, <laughs> now it's out there, right? People know that I'm discerning this call to be a sister. So I visited some sisters in New York. I spent time with sisters in Chicago. And 
And eventually, I found the community that I'm part of now, Republican Systems of the Eucharist, out of Chicago. And it was funny because until I went to the west side of Chicago, I never spent any time working with the poor. I worked a lot in pro-life ministry and helped a lot of women who were experiencing crisis pregnancies, but never had served the poor, never was in a soup kitchen, nothing like that. So God really surprised me by where he called me to give my life because I had never done anything like that before. But when I got there, I realized this is exactly what God made me to do. There was a peace and a joy that I didn't know was possible. And I remember when I was recently graduated from college, I was living with a Catholic family in the city, which was great. I was working for the church. And at night, sometimes, I would try to go to Eucharistic adoration. So we're going to be doing that in a few minutes. Spending time with Jesus, truly present in the Eucharist, and just trying to be there, sharing with him what's on my heart, and trying to listen to him. And I remember the Lord spoke in my heart. So sometimes we can sense the Lord speaking in our hearts. You have to be really quiet to hear what he has to say. But I remember him saying to me, this is, this is crazy, it's like it blows my mind, but he said to me, if you remain faithful to me, I will make you a great example to many people. And I was like, I know what you mean, God. Like, what do you mean by that? And so as I continued to walk with Jesus, and I continued to try to trust his plan for me, it became very clear. Because first, to be a sister, I had to have $94,000 of student loan debt paid off. Anybody agree that's a lot of money? That's a lot of money, OK? And so in less than a year and a half, by running marathons and by getting the story out through the press, people from all over, literally the world, helped send in money to help me pay off my debt. It was a miracle. So the last $11,498 had to be paid off in three weeks before I began the novitiate, where I received the habit. And there was a lady that heard me on Catholic radio. She came by two weeks later and took a tour of the mission where we served the poor, took out her checkbook, and she wrote a check for $11,400.98. And that really happened. And I had never met that woman before in my life. And so because of her desire to help someone give their life to Jesus, I was able to become a sister three weeks later. Then flash forward to last year. Now, I did not even know that the show Chopped existed, OK? Like, I don't watch TV. There are some people that were recruiting, or they were like scouts for the show who are calling convents all over the country, trying to get a sister to apply to be on the show. I love to cook. I cook every day. I cook for eight people. I cook for 600 people. It's all the same. It's all fun, right? So this is just something that I do, and it's a talent that God has given me. So when I heard about this, I said to Father Bob, who's our superior, I think I've got a chance to get on the show. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't even know what the show is, but should I try? He's like, why don't you go ahead and try it? So I applied, and within 12 hours, they called me. And I had some Skype interviews. And then about a month later, they're like, you know, we've got this show. We think you would fit in really well. I was a competing chef. And so they said, do you want to be considered to be cast? And I said, sure. And so within a couple of days, they cast me for this show. They come out to Chicago. Then I fly out to the East Coast to compete last March. So this had to be a big secret for eight months, because you can't tell anybody what happens, right? But in all of that, what did I learn about my walk with Jesus? about the call that was on my life. What I learned was sometimes, for whatever reason, Jesus asks us to do something out of the ordinary for him, right? And you have to believe, like, truly, all those months leading up to that show, I was so nervous. I was asking the Lord, am I really going to be a good witness for you? Do I really have the strength that it takes to do this? Can I really do well at this? I was really afraid, right? But I kept praying and asking for help. And the moment that I walked on that TV set, there was absolutely no fear. I was so confident. I was like scaring myself. I was like, how am I so confident? And I knew that God was with me. I knew that people were praying for me. And I knew that through God's strength that work in me, I could win. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to win. It's going to be great. You know? And I had so much fun. And I loved the people I was competing with. And clearly, it was exactly where God wanted me to be. Um, and so I, I won the show. It was great. Okay? But the thing is, is that it wasn't really for me. It wasn't about winning the show. But it was about trying to be faithful to what God was asking me, trying to follow that call. And I remember what the Lord had spoke to my heart years before when I was in adoration. How he said, if you remain faithful to me, 
I'm going to make you an example to many people. And I feel like that has been lived out in my life a number of times, especially now with this TV show. I've had over 55 interviews now, most of the secular press. The story has gone all over the world. A lot of Latin America has this story about this cooking nun in Chicago. Like, who does that? Do you know what I mean? And so this wasn't for me, but it has been for God's glory. And the most important thing that I've been told was by a very dear friend of mine who we went to college together. She received her first Holy Communion from St. John Paul II because she was a little girl in the Philippines when he visited that country many, many years ago. And I had asked many of my friends to pray for me, and she wrote me an email, and she said, Sister Alicia, I'm just so proud of you, and I want you to know that you don't have to be afraid, because what's going to happen is you're going to be glorifying God on national TV. And that's exactly what happened. It wasn't about me, but it was about God, and about helping the world know that we have brothers and sisters who need our love and our care, and those are the people who are poor, right? And so we did it for them. We did it to help the world know how much we love them and how if we follow God's call for us, no matter how weak we are or broken we are, no matter if we think that we're not worthy, you know what, all that's a lie. Because we're beautiful, we're beloved sons and daughters of God the Father. And even if we've made mistakes, that's why there's forgiveness and mercy, right? We have the sacrament of reconciliation, one of the greatest, best kept secrets of the Catholic Church. You gotta go to confession, man, it's so good for our souls, right? So many things to help us to believe how much God loves us and that he wants to work through us despite our weaknesses. Because this world is so broken and God needs all of us to be great saints, right? To be a saint is so simple. It's just to believe the possibility of God's power through us, right? It's just to do what we're supposed to do every day, doing those ordinary things day in and day out, but doing them in an extraordinary way because we want to do them for God. Okay? Make sense? Yeah. Awesome. So I think that's it for the talk. Are there any questions? Do you think I'm excited to be here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, question. Yeah. Oh, you look familiar. You came out to volunteer at our place. Awesome. Thank you for coming. Who else came to volunteer a couple weeks ago? Thank you for coming. That's awesome. The prize money, so um, I won $10,000, so all the money went to help get food for the people in our neighborhood, so um, yeah, so all the money went to purchase food for our neighbors, which is super exciting. And Sister Stephanie can attest, we've got so much food. We have so much food. We have two walk-in freezers full of food. We can't even get to the food right now. Our neighbors can't even carry the food home from the food pantry because that's how much food we give them. So we are so blessed. Super. We're giving out people huge hams, right, sister? Like 20 pound hams. So awesome. So awesome. And what's also super cool is that all of our neighbors on the west side, they are so happy and proud and pumped about this show. Um, they tell me, they're like, Sister Lisa, you made all of us celebrities. We got the cameras here. Oh, we, got, we had cameras there for like a month. I'm telling you, like, it was crazy. Oh my gosh, like, from like local to national news, it's like, yeah, our lady of the angels is on the map. And for a good reason. Because people in our neighborhood, we're used to being in the news. All of us are used to being in the news because of a homicide or a drug bust or something super negative like that. So for us and our neighbors to be on the news for something positive and something happy, it just means so much. So you see, if you just take a step in faith to follow God's plan for your life, he can do very powerful things for you. And that's, that's the reason, right? That's the point. Not because I'm great. I'm so weak. You don't even know. I'm not going to talk about that, how weak I am. But because I know I'm weak, I can have the courage to ask God for help. And that's why I'm able to do what I can do for him. Yeah. Alright, uh, we're going to get ready to be going to... Uh